Good morning, church. It's good to be here today to sing praises to a God that is real because of a son who lives and has changed our lives forever, isn't it? Um, today we're in the book of Acts chapter 6, so if you would open your Bibles to that, that's where we're going to be. We're going to look at two chapters today. Um, you might even want to open your sermon guide to kind of keep track of what we're going to be talking about. We're starting there in chapter 6, verse 8. It says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. First, don't forget, Stephen has just been made a deacon. We saw that previously in, in two weeks ago in our lesson where it says, and I quote, verse 5, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And so now here he is, a man full of God's grace and power, who did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. We don't know what they are because that's not the purpose of his story here in the book of Acts. He kind of serves as a catalyst in Acts. Satan decides to Stomp on him like an ant, but once he does it, the, stant, the ants scatter everywhere. All the Christians leave Jerusalem for the most part, fleeing to other parts of uh, around the Mediterranean, carrying the gospel of Jesus with them. And, uh, of course, because of that, it goes to the rest of the world. It says, verse 9, Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen. We believe these are Jews who were once enslaved to Romans, who have now been released. It says, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen. Now, when you think of arguing, you probably think of what kids sometimes do when they argue over who gets to use the restroom first in the morning, or over who gets to drive, ride shotgun in the car. They bicker back and forth. I see a couple of y'all laughing. You've seen that. Sometimes it gets physical. Sometimes they throw things. I want you to understand here, I would underline this word argue because that's not entirely what is meant there. The ESV says dispute. Um, the Greek word in its entirety means this, so that you understand what's going on. Two groups come together jointly, voluntarily, to discuss a dispute. And if you look that up in Google, you'll start to see that Greek word, will start, you'll start to see buzzwords like Plato. And the reason is, is because they're getting together, they're having really a debate, a formalized debate over the issue. These men began to argue with Stephen, who'd been visiting the synagogues, to talk with him about the things he said. But they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded, so they couldn't stand up to him, so they decided to go to plan B. They persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law, and they seized, they took Stephen by force and brought him before the Sanhedrin. Seventy-one men, including a high priest, he's standing in the same place Jesus stood when he was condemned. They produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. And he's more specific. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth, and by the way, whenever they say that, uh, say Jesus of Nazareth, if we were to say it today, it would sound like this, that Jesus of Nazareth, right? Uh, if you remember, Nathaniel says in the book of John, oh, has anything good come out of Nazareth? So they are basically um, um, being very mean and slandering Jesus here in, in the way they say that. Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. Now they may have taken something that Christ has said previously out of context. Uh, there was one time Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will build it again in three days. But we know the scriptures are talking about his body. Another place, Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. Maybe that's what they're talking about. 
And then we look at the second accusation that Jesus of Nazareth will change the customs Moses handed down to us. Now Jesus said he was the fulfillment of the law, right? And so maybe the traffic to sacrifice things every day has decreased. Maybe that's what they're really referring to. Verse 15, all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen after he was trying to be respectful, after they're starting to lie about him and to his face, they start to look at him to see if he's going to break. They look at him intently, and what do they see? They saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Chapter 7, the high priest turns to him and asks him, are these charges true? And look at the first words that comes out of Stephen's mouth. Verse 2, brothers and fathers, respect. He was respectful of them. Listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. We're not going to read all of chapter 7. Um, I challenge you to read that on your own, but he, he basically outlines the history of Israel from Abraham to uh, all the patriarchs to Joseph, then to Moses, to King David and Solomon. If you read that, you're going to see some very important words like circumcision, covenant, promise. And so what he's doing is he's tying these people into their old, into their faith and traditions and how important those things are into the now. About Moses, well, first of all, with Abraham, we see that God is present. With Joseph, we see that God, verse 9, is with him. And then in verse 17, we see as the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham. So they're drawing near to that time. And then all of a sudden it switches to Moses, a person who's very important in the Jewish faith. About Moses, some very important verses, verse 35, this is the same Moses whom they rejected. Verse 37, this is the same Moses who told Israelites, God will send you a prophet like me from your own people, a prophecy about Jesus. This is the same Moses, verse 39, that our fathers, notice he, he puts himself in with them, our fathers refused to obey. And then he talks about the idolatry of the golden calf. He then finishes his little history lesson by talking about how the tabernacle that had gone with them, the place where God would go before them in the wilderness, was changed by David in his mind to a concept of a house. Let, let me make a permanent house for you because I love you. I want to worship you here on this earth. And God says, uh, not you, your son can, Solomon will. Let me show you what Stephen says in regards to the first accusation that Jesus will destroy the temple. They say, have you preached that Jesus will destroy the temple? Verse 48, however, the Most High does not live in houses made by men. You guys are so upset about thinking that Jesus said he would come to destroy the temple, and I'm telling you, God doesn't live there. He does not live there. This is not where he resides. They're not too happy about this. He quotes Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1 and 2 there. But then he, he, he uh, answers the accusation about the law. He says, verse 51, I'll read this. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. <laughs> you may be circumcised, but your hearts haven't changed. You are just like your fathers, who he, he's been telling us about, who've rejected Moses. And by the way, Joseph's brothers rejected the blessed one, Joseph. Very similar to that. He says, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? 
They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, that's Jesus, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. Verse 53, you who have received the law that was put into effect through angels but have not obeyed it. You're asking me whether Christ is going to change the customs and I'm telling you, you didn't even keep the customs. Sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. Not only did you murder, but you murdered the Messiah that Moses you lift up, that you lift up, talked about. Now when they hear this, verse 54, they become furious. They gnash their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, despite this, looks up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they cover their ears and they yell at the top of their voices and they all rush him. They drag him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of the young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knew where he was going. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. The last breath is forgiveness. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. When we think about this story, I think it should unsettle us. And I, I think it, it really comes down to the way Stephen has behaved in this situation and what ultimately happens. You think about Stephen for a moment, um, despite his impending doom, he has this face of an angel. Think about that. Here he is an inch from death. And all the while he has peace. And I preach this as Christians in the United States, including many of us, including myself, sometimes get mad when food is not brought out on time or when a doctor keeps us in his office too long. We think about this for a moment and we see that while they are making his life very bleak there towards the end, very dark, he still sees Jesus. As if Christ is there, and he is there with his arms open. And in his last breath, as they're throwing these rocks, they never throw pebbles, they threw big ones. They wanted to do damage as they're throwing them. Here we are today reading the story, and sometimes we get so angry over economy or inflation or democracy with no words of forgiveness on our lips about people who might seek to harm us. I want to be bold for a moment and tell you I believe you could turn on the TV and get enough commentators. We got enough commentators, but what we do not have enough of is people willing to share the light of Jesus. What's the point of today's lesson? To spread the light of Jesus, we got to be like Stephen. We got to be like Moses and Christ. Moses, when he comes off the mountain, his face is shining all aglow. Jesus, when he's transfigured, his face is shining, his clothes are shining. And when Stephen is standing in front of these guys who mean him harm, he's shining, not literally, but he has the face of an angel. He is reflecting God's glory and power and grace. When we ask ourselves, what does it mean to have a face of an angel? Uh, uh, media has so many images of an angel. You can turn on the Looney Tunes and you might see uh, a cherub, one of those fat little cherubs, you know, that's got the, the, the harp or the, the bow and arrow that'll shoot somebody that'll, that'll make them fall in love or something. That's obviously not what is meant here by Scripture. Um, what is meant is when we look there... At verse 8 and C, it describing Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, what you need to understand is when they look intently at him, 
They're, saying, they're seeing God's grace and power lived out on his face. They're seeing things that they do not deserve in his character. I would submit these guys probably, if I was a judge, would deserve death for what they did to Stephen. And yet all the while, Stephen shows them patience and respect. He calls them brothers and fathers. I would show you that uh, when they look intently at him, I know that if this was me, it might be tempting for me to try to plead my cause or to get mad or angry or cry. And we see in Stephen, none of those things take place. We see the power of God. We see an individual who has the face of an angel who does not plead his own life to be let off, but instead pleads for these people to pay attention to the gospel, to Christ, to who he is, a man of power. To spread the light of Jesus, which we must do, listen to what I'm about to say. In order to spread the light of Christ, we must reflect God's grace and power. We must have the nature of God, of Stephen. Otherwise, it's not going to work. When we look at Stephen's faith, you have to understand, Stephen was not always this way. We don't have a story of how he was beforehand, but we know that his faith has changed him. I, I remember in college, I'll tell you this story. When I was in college, one day I'm sitting in the, the classroom with a whole bunch of other students in my physics class, and uh, there's Dr. Espinoza. Andrea probably remembers him. Dr. Espinoza was my physics professor, and he's walking around, he's handing out our first set of tests. And everyone's very chatty, very expectant. Because it was the first one, it was hard, and we'd see the first person get it. Very obvious physical reaction. What do you think that meant? The next person gets it. Shoulders dip, the countenance changes. The next person, next person. I get mine, and I look at it. Time of confession, I'm going to tell you what my grade said. I look at it, and I read, as my stomach fell through the floor, 37. like a thousand silent screams just pierced the darkness of the universe. I knew right then life was over. Never ever got a grade like that. I was pretty sure that I would die at the age of 85 washing dishes at a McDonald's at that time, right then. I was pretty sure that my wife, once I told her, would leave me because of that 37. I was, I was pretty sure that my funeral would have no one except the guy burying me and the guy who was just going to, you know, be paid by whoever to, to say some words. And he would look over and say, why? Why is there no one here? He'd say, he got a 37. I just knew my life was over. And then right then I heard some really angelic news. Dr. Espinoza says, we grade on a curve in this class. I'd never seen one of those. I, I turned to my person, the person next to me. I said, what's the heck? What's, what is that? He said, oh, that means uh, everyone's getting a bonus because we all did really bad. I said, well, I don't think anyone could say this. He goes up there. He writes a 50 on the wall. He says a 50 is 100. 50-point curve. Do you think my demeanor changed? My countenance changed? And from then on, in all my college classes, I was very expectant. Is there going to be a curve? <laughs> I would love for there to be curve right now because I don't know if I can get all this all by myself. And every single one of his tests were curved like that. If we have some kind of understanding about the context we're in, it changes the way we look at things, our look, our outlook, our behavior. Stephen's outlook and behavior has changed from something we're not quite sure what it is to something new. But we see it in the face of opposition and accusations that he's facing. His countenance remains godly, doesn't it? In the face of death, he seeks Christ. And concerning his destination, he knows where he's going. 
And with his last few words, he does something that I don't know most of us would do, and he forgives those in the act of killing him. If we think just about this one place of reading, and we just think about the worldly behaviors we see and his behaviors, we see in them people that are filled with anger. Sure, they start out respectful. Let's, let's get together and have this joint discussion. But all of a sudden, in anger, they start, they start coming up with lies. They are filled with anger, and all the while, there's Stephen. What's he filled with? The Holy Spirit. They're filled with spiritual blindness, even though they say they know everything. Here he is, spiritually insightful. They're intent on causing his death, and Jesus has given him life. He is the focus of their hate, but they are the focus of his love. It's different. His example, the way he reflects God's grace and power, makes him change the way he views certain things. And so I would like to take you through some of these examples. For example, interactions. How we interact with people. You think about Stephen and his example here starts out very respectful. They get mad. Does he get mad back? Brothers, fathers, he's very respectful. You, you go onto Facebook or you go into any conversation in the teacher's lounge on politics or anything, you will quickly find things do not stay respectful. We can look at our world and see that it is not bent towards respect. Even Barack Obama once said that when they go low, we go high. That's a really good idea. And several years ago, um, Eric Holder, one of his attorney generals, I think his only attorney general maybe, said, no, 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 that's not right. When they go low, you kick them. Now, I quote that because that is generally the way people think in the world. In order to get ahead, if somebody is against you and they somehow go low, well, then you better just hit them and smash them and just make it hurt. Make them know that you mean business. We see Stephen's example. He certainly takes the better option. In fact, his example is respectful. Question, are you respectful of people you disagree with? What about passion? There where it says that he was secretly, uh, uh, excuse me, back up to verse 10, that his wisdom in the spirit, they could not overcome that. They could not stand up against it. Uh, a lot of commentators believe that when it says wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke, the spirit by whom he spoke is talking about how much he cares about the situation, his passion for it. In other words, he really wants them to understand what he's trying to get across. This is life and death eternally. You and I have had a lot of passions and may have passions in our life, things that we are passionate about. Some people are passionate about art. Some are passionate about singing. Some are passionate about... Uh, <laughs> Preaching, we can be passionate about preaching. But sometimes our passions are guilt and are, are, are really selfish in the way we do them. Self-seeking. Often lifting up ourselves. Even family can be a passion, but it can be self-seeking. I've known people... But the reason they were so close to their children, at some point, they may have said in a joke, was so that they would have someone watch them when they, when they get old. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're good to your children, you can see that that might happen to you. But that shouldn't be your reason for doing it. You need to be passionate as a Christian, as Stephen was passionate about people hearing wisdom of Christ. 
Um, if you don't come on Wednesday nights, let me go ahead and tell you, I heard something that was uh, very well vocalized this last Wednesday night. Uh, Lyndon was doing a very good job with his lesson. And Jim raises his hand and he says, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing Jim, but he basically says, I think sometimes we don't understand what we're supposed to be doing because things have changed. How many people were Christian at the time of Stephen? Not a lot. How many people are Christian today or claim to be Christian? A lot. And so that's why I need you to understand, I'm not telling you uh, that the, the purpose of what we're doing is to share the gospel with every single person, but sometimes the purpose is simply to share light, to share truth. And what we see here is your passion should be selfless to help other people learn and know what it means to glorify God. Does Stephen glorify God? He doesn't even try to stand up for himself. And yet, when they're hurling these abuses at him, is it better to glorify God and to cry out and scream, or is it better to do what he does and be a living lesson as Christ was? He's so passionate about it. Here's another one. Scripture, how do we reflect God's countenance like Stephen in Scripture. Look at it. Does Stephen know his Scripture? Oh, man. He, he gives this whole long story from the Old Testament, the beginning, and all the way through. But it's not just because he knows Scripture. Did you know you can know a lot of Scripture and know all the facts and yet not have the face of an angel? There's a guy by the name of Bart Ehrman who uh, believes, well, actually, he, he can quote Probably anybody here, he could beat you in a quote battle and biblical knowledge probably, and he does not believe Jesus Christ is resurrected. Missing an important point, wouldn't you say? Stephen not only could quote and use the Old Testament and apply it to these guys, but he believed it. He could apply it to the moment. He took, takes this Old Testament and then he applies it to the two accusations. This is very important because we have had, over the last 20 or 30 years, kind of like this, this fad, I think, in Christian churches where we say, when you're in conversation with people, you're talking with people, don't quote Bible. In fact, the Bible's good, but leave that at church. Because if you talk to people about Scripture, you might come across as self-righteous, judgmental, unrelatable. Have you seen the world? The problem is not that we have too much Scripture. I'm telling you, the problem is we have too little of God's wisdom. When was the last time you studied your Bible outside of this moment, outside of Wednesday night? When was the time that you took to yourself to open the Word of God and to read it with purpose. In order for us to be reflecting the countenance of God, we can't do that without His wisdom. We have to have His wisdom. Uh, I'll tell you an acronym to help you out. REST. you got to rest in Scripture. R-E means read it you got to read it. My goodness. Spend time reading the Bible intently for a purpose. Don't let it be just because you're at church because then you might just be an observer. When you're at home and you open it and you read it with intention, you start to no longer be an observer. You start to interact with it. Read it as study it. Read it more than once. Read it four times. Maybe get a commentary. Read along with that. And finally, probably the most important one, T, talk about it. As a teacher, I could tell you the best way to learn your content, teach it. Talk about it. Rest in Scripture. We have to be people who apply God's wisdom, not just know the facts, but apply it to ourselves today. Which brings us to number four, how we look at other people. 
It's very simple for us to look at people in the world and think they're so different, they're so lost, that I don't want to have anything to do with them. I need to be separate. Some people get so obsessed with politics, but the other part of the other part of that spectrum for some Christians is they say, no, we can't be involved with anything, and they stick their head in the sand like an ostrich. Pretend that nothing's happening so that we can be palatable to a world and therefore light, and maybe that's how we will find people. If a, if a Christian or a church's goal is to be palatable in this world, it's not a church that I really want to be in. Salt and light. Flavor is added. Light is added to the darkness. We don't become stale. We don't become darkened. We need to understand people. Um, did Stephen understand who he was talking to? Yeah. He speaks their lingo, doesn't he? That's one of the reasons they get so mad. Because he can apply their lingo in a way they still don't understand. And notice, physically, what do they do? Ah! And they cover their ears. They don't want to hear what he's got to say. Just like he said, your hearts are uncircumcised. You guys are hard-hearted, stiff-necked. They show it. When a Christian goes into Iran or Afghanistan, do you think they've done their homework? Do you think that they've studied the Muslim faith? I hope so. Do you think that they know what Sharia law is? Most likely. They probably know what law is not to break. Did you know there's a lot of countries that we have Christianized, we have brought the, the gospel to, who are beginning to send missionaries to the United States for good reason. And as they send missionaries to the United States, they're training their people on false teachings taught in the United States. They're training their people on false human ideals that are being taught politically and in some churches. Here we are, people, you and I are experts in our own country. Do we use that? Do we want to study that more so that when we see people we don't understand, we can understand them and therefore apply Scripture in a way that heals? When I say apply Scripture, I don't say find a homosexual and say, read Romans chapter 1 and 2. You know, we might read that here because we need to understand it's a sin, but when we're talking to someone out in the world, we talk about the fact that we have something in common with those people. How many of us are sinners? How many of us? I am. All of us. I am no better. But because of Jesus Christ, I have hope for tomorrow. And I know He has saved me and I get to live in His Spirit we have to begin to understand what it means to apply this to people's lives. Really, that means we not only become experts of the Bible, but we become experts of the culture. Does that mean we live in it, of it? Does it, church? No. So, the question remains, do you live as Christ lived? Um, when I was a kid, I visited Grandpa and Grandma's house in Portales, and they had a VHS player with three VHS movies. One of them was one of my favorites of all time. Raise your hand if you've ever seen this movie, The Inspector General with Danny Kay. Oh, I'm like the only person. I think I saw one other. I think, yes? Okay, good, yeah. We have one other. You've got to watch this movie. It's actually a good movie. I recommend it. It is hilarious. It's a slapstick comedy, and I will give you, I'm going to spoil it for you, but you still got to watch it. That's your homework. Some of your homework. You got more homework. Danny Kay plays a buffoon, and his friend who uses him 
talks him into posing as the inspector general of Napoleon as he goes into this town. Okay, I'm getting some nods. Like, I remember this. Okay. And, and so he goes along with it, and they're trying to throw their daughters at him because he's an important guy. He could have all of them hung. They start to get all their money, and they bring him chests of money. They, he gets all the food he can eat, which he loves because he's poor. There's one point in which the real inspector general pops up. And he's about to be hung. And Danny Kaye's friend hands him, slips him the gentleman's writ of authority given by Napoleon. And, and he takes it out and he's like, yeah, that's, that's me. And they're, they're about to hang the real inspector general. But he can't bring himself to do it. He says, I'm a fake. The real inspector general takes off the, the, the chain around this guy's neck that is the mayor, and he puts it on Danny Kaye's character. He says, you're the new mayor. Danny Kaye says, I don't deserve this. I can't read. I can't write. And he says, but you got what matters. If we pretend to have the face of an angel, we're going to be found out as fakes and we will be buffoons in the most tragic sense of the word. But instead, if we admit that we are lacking the things that, that I'm outlining, like, for example, respecting people in conversation or we're lacking a true good passion for the gospel, and sharing light, or that we're lacking the Bible study. Something tells me that hits a few of y'all. Or we're lacking homework for this culture. And what's going to happen is we will be found out as fakes. But if we instead admit it, and we say, Jesus, I want to follow you. We can live in his presence and like Stephen be transformed into someone who when he follows Christ and says he follows Christ, he means it. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? All right, let's be a little louder. Do you believe Jesus Christ died for the forgiveness of your sins? Do you believe that Jesus is going to come back? Yes. Do you believe he's your king and you want to follow him? Yes. Do you believe he's your example? Yes. Listen, Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. He died. Just want to point that out. Peter said, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He died. John, whoever claims to live in him, key word, must live as he did. It's on the fence whether he died a martyr. Are you living as Jesus did? Have you given your life to Christ and seek to share the light with others?